Hi, my name is Rich, and today we're going to be looking at the Way of the Mercy Monk. It's a monk subclass found in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and it's the Healer Monk. Most classes have a Healer subclass. For example, you have the Divine Soul Sorcerer, the Celestial Warlock, and the Circle of Dreams Druid. Now, aesthetically and character-wise, this subclass is based around the old uh, Plague Doctor Monk stereotype, so it's like a bird mask with a giant beak. And I think that it's fusing two different monks. The monk class in and of itself is based around a lot of Kung Fu and Asian culture. So to bring this European style into it, it makes sense for a healer, but it doesn't really make sense for a hand-to-hand -hand combatant. So it's a little bit of a stretch, but I think that mechanically it adds something, but Thematically, it's a little bit of a jumbled mess. This is where the players come in. A good player can take a, an interesting mechanic or concept and convert it to add flavor to their own character. So I've got confidence that you're able to change the Way of Mercy Monk around if you're wanting to play it. So let's have a look and see what they get at level three. Implements of Mercy. You gain proficiency in insight and medicine skill, and you get proficiency with a herbalism kit. Now, most kits you think, oh, you can identify things, it's not very special, but the Herbalism Kit is the exception. If you go into Xanathar's Guide of Everything, there are rules for crafting, and you can craft healing potions in your downtime. And if you want to go by the rules as written, a healing potion takes one day, 25 gold. The problem is most groups of players will not have one, three, or four weeks downtime just to make one potion and spend 10,000 gold. That's a little bit extreme. So if you compare this to actual skills, I think that making some healing potions in the first five or seven levels has some value just to try and issue them out to other people and to get them back on their feet in an emergency. But it's an okay ability. It's not fantastic. I do think that the crafting system needs a major overhaul in Dungeons & Dragons, but the problem is with 5e, you want to keep it streamlined, and the whole idea of crafting can be very granular and complex and can take a lot of time and effort just for not a lot of results. You do get this cool table, uh, the Merciful Mask table, where you can roll 1d6 or you can just pick whichever one you want, let's be honest. And it gives you some idea of what the mask you're going to be wearing will look like. And I think one of the best ways to yoink and twist this idea is you could completely make a luchador out of this. A monk is a good basis for a luchador because you have some hand-to-hand -hand combat, you have uh, extra abilities, but at the same time you can tie the mask into the theme of the character as well. You can go for something like La Parca or something more sinister like Mil Muertes or Prince Puma, who knows? Obscured luchador knowledge aside, I think we should focus on the Hand of Healing, the other ability you get at level 3. Uh, as an action, you can spend one key point to touch a creature and restore a number of hit points equal to your martial arts die and your wisdom modifier. But when you use Flurry of Blows, you can replace one unarmed strike for the use of this feature without spending a key point for healing. Now, it's worth noting that I don't think this interacts with the... Give me one second. Don't think this interacts with the E-Fueled Attack ability that is optional it's additional rules that were put in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. So if you're just going by the player's handbook, then uh, don't worry too much about this. You have the Hand of Healing, but you also have the Hand of Harm. Essentially, you get the option to cure wounds or inflict wounds. With Hand of Harm, uh, whenever you hit a creature with an unarmed strike, you can spend one key point to deal necrotic damage. And this is additional to your original damage. And necrotic damage is very rarely resisted. Now there are undead creatures that are resistant to immune to necrotic damage but outside of the undead armies I think that most of the other races, classes and characters would find this quite damaging. Now this is connected to your martial arts die so it does scale up over time so it won't be too underpowered you'll still be using this at later levels. Now the Hand of Harm would work with the unarmed strike with the additional rules. The Hand of Healing does not. Uh, the limit, the caveat, is that Hand of Harm, you can use it only once per turn. And I believe there is no limit to the Hands of Healing, how many times you can do it in one turn. 
Yeah, as an action, you can spend one key point to touch a creature and restore the number of hit points. So if, for whatever reason, you have an additional action on your turn, you're multi-classing into Fighter, for example, then you could do this twice in a turn. I think with Hand of Healing, you have to spend your action to use Hand of Healing, and then if you do Flurry of Blows after this, you can replace one of the unarmed strikes with it without spending a key point. But you can't just replace... Actually, I think you can. You can just replace one of your flurry of blows with a hand of healing without spending key points. It's the action that is a separate sentence altogether. So yeah, uh, at level three, you can start healing people up in mid combat. That's the essential part because uh, life clerics, for example, they're good at healing people in or out of combat. But essentially, when you're in combat and someone is knocked down, you need someone to take them up to less than more than zero hit points. That's the whole goal of healing in combat. As long as you're one or above, then you can attack. So I wouldn't call this the main support of the group, but if you have this in addition to another character that can heal, then this can really add a lot of resilience to your party. At level six, you get Physician's Touch. When you use the Hand of Healing ability we just talked about, you can also end a condition. This is blinded, deafened, paralyzed, poisoned, or stunned. And when you use the Hand of Harm, you can add the Poison condition to the end of the next turn. Poisoned creature has disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks. Doesn't sound like much, just a little small sentence, but practically using this, I've had a Plague Monk in the... Plague Monk. In the past, I've had a Way of Mercy monk. Uh, it was called COVID-19. It was a Kenku monk. It was quite cool. But uh, when I was attacking and I was able to poison uh, level like CR-19 creatures, like uh, purple worms, for example, this really helped out the rest of the party. Because poisoned is a status, it's going to still be effective at low levels and at high levels. It has a overarching effect. It's not just going to get weaker as you progress through the game. The downside is a lot of creatures have resistance or immunity to poison, so you have to be aware of that when you're potentially using this uh, ability. But yeah, generally, it's a really strong ability. The dealing with situational effects is situational. Uh, it's nice to have in your back pocket, but you're not going to be using it every turn. But the poisoned ability is really strong. And by that time, you have Stunning Strike as well, at level 5. So you can stun them, you can poison them, you can essentially take a creature out of combat. And make sure your DM is aware of this, because it can feel a bit unfair when the combat goes so one-sided. But I think that's just a critique of Stunning Strike more than anything else, which uh, we sh I'm sure we can talk about that in a later video. Next up at level 11, we get uh, Flurry of Healing and Harm. When you use Flurry of Blows, you can replace each unarmed strike with the use of Hands of Healing without spending key points for the healing. So you can do it more than once per turn. The downside is you have to be within reach of the creature to heal them up. So that is the distinct disadvantage. Uh, if someone has a healing word spell, a bard for example, because it has range and it's a bonus action, it's more flexible. Make sure you pick the right race that allows you to zoom around and heal people up all the time. It does have a good bit of synergy with the monk's ability to uh, be unhindered when moving around and having additional speed as well every turn. You can almost be r running from the front line, healing up the paladin, you can run to the back, heal up the wizard in one turn. I don't know any other class that combines the mobility with the healing factor as well, so this makes it a unique melee healing class, I think. Uh, the other part of Flurry of Healing and Harm is when you use Flurry of Blows, you can use Hand of Harm with that strike without spending a key point. So it's really saving your key points so you can deal more Flurry of Blows, you can deal more stunning strikes. Uh, it's just an economy thing, but it can be helpful. I think it's not the most flashy or extravagant use of this level 11 slot, but it's still going to be is still going to give you tangible benefits. And finally, at level 17, quite far into the game, you get Hand of Ultimate Mercy. As an action, you can touch a corpse of a creature that has died within the past 24 hours, and you spend five key points. 
You can return it to life, at regaining a number of hit points equal to 4d10 plus your wisdom mod. So you could do this in combat. I think that it's very expensive, but by the time you're at level 17, you have... So by the time you're at level 17, you have uh, 16 key points. So I think you can afford to splash out and spend five key points on this. As a little added bonus, you can remove blind, deaf, and paralyzed, poison, and stunned when you reanimate. But uh, it's tied to a long rest as well, so it's a one and done sort of thing. You can't just keep pulling people back from the brink of death. It's on theme because you're a healer, you're a monk, and it's going to have a great bit of flavor, a great character moment. I think at the higher levels, you're looking for interesting character moments because you've been with the character for so long. You're not just looking for mechanical benefits. So yeah, tell me what you think of the Way of Mercy Monk. Uh, do you like it? Do you dislike it? Is it overpowered? Uh, and leave it a comment and tell me all about it. Now for the feats, the first one I chose is Telepathic. You can get a boost to your Wisdom. Uh, you can choose Charisma, but it's not relevant to the Monk. And you have Telepathy for 60 feet. Uh, being able to communicate with people over 60 foot is great out of combat, and it can be somewhat helpful in combat. It depends how stringent the DM is when applying the rules for free actions and speaking. You also get the added bonus of Detect Thoughts. You can do this once every long rest. Uh, Detect Thoughts is a good spell. It's not the best in the world, but I think that uh, as a feat, it's a really handy thing to have in your back pocket. Now, the next feat I want to mention is the Chef feat. Yes, you do have healing. In combat, you're a great healer, but outside of combat, the Chef feat is always handy. Uh, as always, you can boost up your wisdom with this. And if you're looking at the player's handbook, there are very few feats that allow you to boost your wisdom. So thankfully, uh, in Tasha's Corner and everything and Xanathar's Guide to everything, there have been some additional feats that can help. For a short rest, you can help other people uh, spend their hit point die and gain extra points back. And after a long rest, here's the cruel part. You can add uh, temporary hit points to people when they eat your whatever you're cooking. Plus, it always adds good flavor. It's always interesting to find out characters really good at cooking as well as herbalism. Next up, this feat is from Fizban's Treasury of Dragons, Gift of the Gem Dragon. Now I went straight for this because it gives you a wisdom boost, but also it has some telekinetic abilities which I don't know how you're going to tie into the theming of the, of the monk, but if you're playing a game that has a dragon in it then I'm sure you could uh, work it into the narrative quite easily. And this is handy for melee classes as well, because essentially when you take damage, you can make them have a strength saving throw, I believe, and you can push them back. You can deal damage, push them back with some force damage. And this can be helpful when you're attacking, you push them away, and then it's up to them to come back into your range of attack. So if you have a melee wizard, for example, that has booming blade, that could be quite a helpful thing. Pushing someone out of the way and they're attacked with a booming blade, it's their responsibility to move back into ranged combat. So the damage would go off. It wouldn't automatically apply from moving away, but it's them coming back when it happens. Now, for the races, I know it's a cliche, but elf. I would totally go for an elf from the player's handbook because you get a natural boost to dexterity. And having trance is always helpful as well. It's not the best ability in the world, but uh, I think that. Between this and having advantage in perception, saving throws against being charmed, uh, yeah, it's a really appropriate race to pick for the monk. Any monk would take advantage of this. Now my second pick is Goblin, which I think that mechanically Goblin is tailor-made for the monk. You get an additional dexterity boost and you get constitution, which is always helpful. I don't know why Goblins get constitution, but I'm not complaining about it. Uh, here's the best part. As a bonus action, you can disengage or hide. Now, this does naturally adapt to the Shadow Monk, but I do think that the Way of Mercy Monk also takes advantage of this. Also, you get Fury of the Small, which I know is a little boost, a little benefit, but all this extra damage does add up over time. It can be quite helpful, and uh, it's tied to a short rest, so who's going to refuse extra damage? Now, my final pick is the Loxodon. It's the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica book that it comes from, so it's a Magic the Gathering setting. But yeah, Loxodons are just like giant, lumbering uh, elephant men. 
uh, you get natural boost to constitution and plus one to wisdom. Here's the, where it gets a little bit redundant. When you have your natural armor ability, it, your, when you're not wearing armor, your AC is 12 plus your constitution modifier. But as a monk, you're already getting some uh, unarmored natural AC bonuses. So you have to balance it out to see how you want to play this. But having the extra resilience and the powerful build, it adds up to a monk elephant that can heal people. Very caring, nurturing, almost like Dumbo's mother. <laughs> but uh, And the trunk is always helpful as well. You can use it in some cool situations. You can use it as a snorkel or uh, you can push things around. Unfortunately, you can't use it for unarmed strike. But if you ask your DM, I'm sure you could add some flavor into it. A flurry of blows would be a punch punch. And If you're interested in choosing another monk subclass, then check the pinned comment or the description. There should be a playlist of all the other monk subclasses I've covered. And if you're interested in helping out the channel, if you go over to the Patreon, then there are several subclasses available at the moment. And uh, we're going to be updating and adding a new subclass every month. Well, thanks for watching. I'll speak to you next time. Bye. Thanks.